Hi folks and welcome to this episode of Michael's Backyard Marina. Today I'm going to be doing a, a fan switch out, fan motor switch out on my Jeep Grand Cherokee. It started to overheat. Kind of a sad thing because I wanted to be able to go fishing today possibly, but my tow vehicle needs some fixing. So I had to skip fishing this Saturday morning. Hopefully get ready to go out Sunday morning. We'll see how that goes. I'm going to show you, go through the steps here, of pulling out the fan shroud, switching out the fan motor. And I did discover yesterday that my radiator was also had a crack here in the neck. So I've got new parts. Uh, we're going to get this thing swapped out and we're going to, I'll give you an idea how much time it's going to take to do this total time uh, that it takes me. I'll walk through some of the difficult parts on it. Uh, some, there's some areas in here that it's hard to get to a couple of bolts. I'll show you what I use to get to those. And we'll, uh, let's get started on this thing. Appreciate you joining me today. Let's get this Jeep that I call Donkey back on the road again. Let's get going. All right, folks, as you can see here, the temperature gauge is starting to creep up a little bit. Not digging on that too much. So that's why I got a new fan coming, my second fan. See how it keeps crawling up? I'll start to move and hopefully it'll come back down. As you can see here, I've got a brand new radiator, my electric fan motor, and as long as you're putting in a new radiator, buy a brand new radiator cap. Don't put the one that's on it that's been there forever. Um, put a new one on it, it's, it's just a wise thing to do, an expensive thing to do. And then I got my antifreeze, it's not pre mix. I mix it 50-50, get you, get you your best heating and cooling uh, protection. And uh, we'll take this jug, mix it 50-50. When we're all done, we'll top this thing off and we'll run it and see how she does. Okay, first thing we gotta do is get these four radiator shroud bolts out. There's two up top, there's two down the bottom. The two top ones, and this one's easy to get at. The one on the bottom, you gotta get at from underneath. That's the easiest way to get to it. And I use a little extension with some tape on it so it don't flop around so much on it. And I can reach in and back that bad boy off. Let's get after it. Okay, we got the bottom bolts out. They're kind of miserable. I used a combination of a little flex head ratchet wrench and my 10 millimeter swivel. A 10 millimeter socket on a swivel with my quarter inch drive it was able to come out now let's disconnect the fan wire and pull this out okay folks sorry i didn't get the rest of pulling the fan shroud out i've got it sitting over here ready to switch out the motor uh my phone my camera got overheated here and stopped working so now you can see that the shrouds out of the way you can get to everything there's a lower hose down here we got to get two transmission lines broke loose and the upper radiator hose and we'll be able to pull this thing out it can't be much holding it in i don't think i hope we'll find out stay tuned all right right now we got the antifreeze draining while that's draining i'm going to go ahead and break these lines loose and take these hoses loose and to get at the the radiator mounts wonderful engineers at Chrysler said hey why don't we make this so you have to go through the grill so we'll stick it right there And if you're an engineer and you take offense to that comment, I'm not apologizing for it.
Okay, folks, I'm going to catch up a little bit on what it took to get this radiator out. It's a little bit ridiculous of how this thing was engineered. I literally had to pull this headlight bucket loose. I had to pull this headlight bucket loose. I had to get this so I could flex this so I could flex this out here. So this cross member right here that goes across the front could come out. There's no room for the radiator to go back at all and then come out. Down in here, you can see the frame right here comes in narrower. And here's your steering sector. It has to come straight up by all this garbage. And same here, it has to come straight out. It can't go back, can't tilt. It's a little tight. I'm not pleased with the engineering behind this piece of crap. Now, the other thing I had to do, I had to take the air box loose because the way this piece fits up front comes in here fits so tight that you had to get things loose in order to get it popped out without breaking it. I think my biggest issue is that right there. See that symbol right there? That's probably part of it. And so I got the air box loose, I got that loose. But I did get it out. I did get it out and it's laying over here. Underneath some radiator fluid that I drained out. I didn't want the animals to get into it. So what happened, I had a heck of a time getting the slower lower hose off this came all out as an all out i couldn't get it to rotate and break loose without it uh twisting my line so i had to order a new lower line to go on it and that won't be here till wednesday so we'll pick it back up then and try to get it all back together and hopefully ready to go fishing by next weekend so as you can see it looks like the clouds out here are getting a little dark i'm gonna do a little cleaning up here uh picking up some tools because uh, I want to close the close the lid down on this thing a little bit to see if I can uh, uh, keep the rain and the weather out till I get a chance to finish it up. Oh, here's another interesting fact for you. There's screws all along the top of this chrome piece here, plastic chrome piece, and down the front. You pull all those out, and it looks like oh cool, that'll pop out and get out of my way so I can work on it. No, it's still hooked to part of the bumper. That's a really really neat piece of work they did here for us the other thing I wanted to show you see if I can get a picture over here this plug see how dark it looks on the left hand side there I'm a little concerned about that connection I had a heck of a time getting that plug pulled apart so I think what I'm gonna do is get me another automotive grade plug I'm gonna splice the wires here and get me a new plug put in uh, I don't have to splice it in on the other motor too or the the motor the new motor I got for the fan but I don't see any other way around it because I want to make sure I maintain a good connection there. Without a good connection, could smoke another fan, I suppose. So yeah, it's going to take, it took me a little while wrestling around with it this morning to get it apart to figure out where all the screws were. There's a plastic piece right down here that was up behind right here, right where my hand's at. And it blocked, to be, to block the ability to get to the screw back here on the radiator. And then I had to get the headlight out because... Where it locked in at is right here, so I could push and pull enough to get that thing broke or pulled out of the way, so I could get it in. It was a wrestling match. Uh, worst wrestling match I've ever had on a radiator. But we got it out, and I'm kind of concerned because it still comes out really, really tight. There's really, really narrow width space for it to fit into, and I really don't want to push and jerk and yank on the on the new one going back in. So I'm gonna see if there's a way I can finesse it back in. We'll give it a shot. Anyway, that catches us up, folks, and where we're at there. Uh, here again, uh, some of the screws that held this piece in place right here. They had regular 10 millimeter screws holding it down and then they had a combination of some torque screws. Uh, just, uh, this was all factory. You could tell it was all matched, but just a mixed match of crazy types of screws that I think engineering would have put the same kind of screws across the whole top just for ease of assembly. But we'll get it back together. We'll get this donkey back on the road and see if we can get me to get it to take me to the lake a few more times. So sorry if I didn't catch all the details up with you when I was pulling it apart or in the video. Uh, turned out to be more of a wrestling match than I expected it to be, but we've got there, we've, we've got it out. And the other piece of magic that's kind of cool, and I say that with heavy, heavy, heavy amounts of sarcasm, is that in order to get the radiator out, you actually have to lift this up and out of the way and up from the bottom out and push it forward because it's this actually sets into a couple of clips on the bottom of the radiator and traps it down there that way 
So yeah, so you can't just lift straight up. You got to lift this up and then set it back down a little bit to clear it about a half inch. And then you can take the radiator out. So yeah, it's just a, it's a, it's a wonder they ever got these things off the production line. But I guarantee, guarantee you the engineers did not have serviceability in mind when they put this part of it together. I guarantee you that. If they did, there's no way they did. I'm just going to stick with that. All right, folks. Well, uh, see you on Wednesday, and we'll get the uh, get it put back together. See if we can get old Donkey running again and get us back and forth to the lake. Okay, folks. It's a couple days later. I'm still waiting on parts, but I finally got the radiator snuck back in there. It was not easy. I ended up removing... Well, there's this one metal bracket that comes all the way across here that I showed you. But then these two posts here that sit down in there and hold the hood support latch in place. I ended up pulling those out. That allowed me enough room to bring the A-coils and the air conditioner unit forward just enough that I could just sneak this thing by without damaging it. What a pain in the butt. But we're there. I got it in there. I kind of slid the lower radiator hose on. We're going to go back into putting some... I'm going to go ahead and put the mounts back through the grill that tie the A-coils to the radiator. I'm going to put my supports back in place. I'll start assembling the front part of the hood, or front part of the bracket here, and get my headlights bolted back down and get that buttoned up. And I'm not going to put the fan shroud in until I get my lower radiator hose, or lower, uh, not radiator hose, but the uh, transmission line. That's supposed to show up tomorrow, or Wednesday. One step closer. Let's see what I can do for getting some pieces back on this bad boy. Get out. Alright folks, on this radiator job, there's one more piece of the puzzle here. I'm doing the, uh, replacing the motor because I have a feeling it's gotten half burned up by having a bad connection. I'll show you a little bit of that here in a second. I showed you the one in the Jeep, in the vehicle. First thing you gotta do is knock this little clip off. And then the fan should lift off. Post like that. Then take note of how your wires are routed. As it comes out through a little slot here, up and around, and out right here. So I'm going to cut that little zip tie and have there and there. Now the fan's pretty much ready to come free. Looks like we have three. These are 10 millimeter. Looks like plastic screws. Lift the old one out. Put the new one in. Don't get much simpler than this so far, does it? Yeah. That's 
gonna wrap this right back up where that one came from. That keeps it out of the way of the blades and every other problem that might come along with it. Well, somehow, during shipping, it looks like that got bent a little bit. I wondered about that. I didn't look at it, I didn't notice it when I took it out of the box, but hopefully everything else is fine. Pretty thin piece of metal. Flattens out pretty quick. Use an impact on these, just go, go, light, go lightly with it. Bring her down snug. It is plastic. Just like that. That's back in play. Got to line up the little triangles on the back of the... Get it all the way seated down in there. Just like that. Make sure you put your clip back on. zip tie these back into place like a hat like they were now what you'll notice on here this is a brand new plug and unfortunately I can't use it because the one in the Jeep is bad but I did cut the old one off as you can see here and I took it with me as a, a sample in order to make sure I got the right gauge wire I bought one of these type of plugs so these are plugged together like that I'll cut it in half there solder half of it onto the fan and the other half in the Jeep. Then I'll have me a nice mechanical connection here for the plug-in. And this I didn't realize, but these come in, this is a 10 gauge wire. So this wire is actually a little bit heavier duty than the wire that's on the Jeep. So if anything, go heavier, don't go lighter. If you go lighter, that could be a point of resistance and it could heat up and burn up on you. Once I put these together in the Jeep, what I'll do is I'll most likely put a zip tie here and here, and then I'll zip tie them together that way it can't come apart on me. Should make a pretty good connection. So that's what I'm doing to fix mine. So we'll zip tie this back in place. My handy dandy zip tie drawer. There's a hole right here where the original one was, had like a push lock. One of those almost one time use type push in the place connector, so I'll take advantage of that hole. And that'll help support that wire and keep it out of harm's way. So just like that, I'll cut off the excess. Otherwise, it'll be like a card in a bicycle spokes. All right, then the other one I'm going to tie in right here. Around this, so it's locked in. Safe and sound. Now I won't go through the showing you guys how to solder stuff or how I solder and make wiring connections. You watch some of my other videos, you'll see how I do it. Now I'm ready to cut that plug off. Seems a shame to cut the perfectly good plug off, but I want to save as much wire as I can here and cut that off and then I'll strip this back a little bit so I can heat shrink it and make sure when you're putting the plug together here this is a blue and a black wire. I'm going to make sure the one wire, like if I put the white wire on the black one here, I'm going to put the white wire on the black one there. That way they stay connected and I can't get them switched around backwards. Anyway, we'll do that. You know, no need for me to sit here and show you how I'm going to solder wires together. I'll do this in there and here and on the Jeep. And life is good. Okay, I just wanted to show you real quick how I hooked this together. So here's my plug right here. 
I've got this soldered underneath here. I got two pieces of heat shrink tubing here around each wire. Then I got this tape that I've got that's a uh, rubber tape. It's not sticky on either side, but when you pull and stretch it and wrap it around tight, it adheres to itself very well. It becomes almost one piece. And so I put that down here. So I've got a, I got a connection that's so secure, it's almost sickening. And I've already placed my heat shrink tubing on this end. So when I get this back in the vehicle, well, I don't have to get it back in the vehicle. I'm going to pull this off and I'll solder this into the vehicle. Then when I drop the fan in, plug and done, just like this. Now, I covered up my colors, so, but I do remember black went to white, red went to blue wire. So black and white, red and blue. Just got to remember that for tomorrow night. That's it, folks. Tomorrow night, we'll solder it in. My other part will be in. And we'll get my Jeep back together. Okay, folks, I was talking about the wire color and what I was trying to remember to get together. Well, come to find out, the wire color on the fan, the aftermarket fan I bought, motor, uh, is different than the one on the car, obviously. So I plugged it in real quick, just kind of hooked it in to make sure I get my colors right. So on this right-hand side here, what I'm going to call right-hand side is green, goes the blue. I don't have a lot of light right now. Anyway, green goes to blue, and then this purple and black stripe goes to black. So I gotta get that. I gotta get that right, and make sure I get the when I cut this, I get the two colors matched up. So the fan runs in the right direction. So I'm gonna cut that, solder it. We'll be back. Okay, folks, I don't know if you have one of these tools, but they're very handy. As you can see here, I've got, it's like a pliers or whatever you want to call it, mechanism. That's hooked to a cable that hooks to this little compressor. See how that works right there? And I can release it. It comes back open. This is for getting on the spring clamps. I'm going to show you up top on my upper radiator hose uh, how it works. So this is the handy tool. Like here, you put the radiator hose on. You got your constant tension spring clamp here. This makes it easy for you to grab because these are hard to grab sometimes. So you can hook on to it. Use this hand pliers to squeeze it. You don't want to overstretch it. You just want to squeeze it far enough that it can slip over where it needs to go. But the nice thing is it holds on to it, holds a holds it open while you. And it's got a ratcheting thing here, so it holds it tight. I can go up the next click and get it up here in place. So once I've got it in place like that, I can release it. Puts the tension back on it. Lock down. Ready for business. Now you guys might think that that's pretty easy. Why don't you just use channel locks or something like that? Well, let me show you the, the reason this is very handy. I want to get right down in here. Take you down into the deep here. See if you can see this. This one here is down at the bottom of the radiator. A lot harder to get at. More things in the way. But with that cabling system and the way it clamps it, I can just reach down there, hook it around it, squeeze it, slide it into place, and release it. So you can see the advantage when you got to get down and get at it like that. But I showed you on the top one just to show you how well it works. So I'd suggest you get one if you're going to do any kind of work on cars. Uh, they seem to have, they use these a lot on cars. You can see one here, here. Some people don't like them. But I like them because the nice thing about them is they give constant tension. Now you get one of the screw clamps, the regular worm gear type uh, hose clamps, and they're fine and dandy. They'll get tight. Then once the rubber gives a little bit and things settle down, they're not quite as tight as they were. What's nice about these is they got a constant tension on them, and it's a full circle tension, uh, smooth and clean, and it will actually, uh, as this was to soften up, these just grip a little tighter and a little tighter. So that's why I like them. So I suggest you get that tool. So now what I'm gonna do is go ahead and put the bottom hose clamp on. I got the upper hose on. 
I'm going to slide the radiator back in place. Well, I'm going to take this one back off again, actually, because it's going to be my way to put the radiator or the fan back in. But I'm really close, waiting for that clamp to show up today or that clamp, that uh, transmission line to show up today. I'll put that back in place. I'm almost ready to rock and roll. Hi, folks. We're back. My part arrived today. As you can see here, this one here was a little bit kinked up. Not bad, but it was a... Uh, it was enough I didn't want to use it. I'm not going to go to this much effort to put a new radiator in and then kind of put it together halfway. I got I got to do it right. The only unfortunate part is this little part was $36 plus shipping, so about $39 altogether from Amazon. But it's here. I ordered it last Saturday. It's Wednesday. It showed up. It's dark out right now, but we're going to get this put in. I'm not sure how much detail I'll be able to show you. Let's get after it. Okay, I'm just going to do a quick recap of what I did tonight. So I already had everything pre-fit. I checked it once uh, earlier today after I had the fan in. I had the part. I put the part in, tightened it in. Both the transmission lines are tight now. Uh, don't over tighten them. You could break something, but I got them tight enough. We're going to watch for leaks. Uh, there's one bolt in the bottom of the radiator shroud over here. That's hard to get at. So if I have to pull this back out again, I don't want to waste time putting this in in case I got a leak. Because if I got a leak, I got to pull this shroud back out to get to those bolts. Another excellent design feature. So I've got all the hoses hooked back up here. The two transmission lines are hooked up. My fan is now officially plugged in with my new plug. I'm ready to start putting some 50 50 antifreeze in it. Once I get it full, I'll start it up and, and burp the system to make sure the system has it's full and doing what it needs to do. We'll see if the fan kicks on. We'll hopefully hear the fan kick on. So let's get started dumping in antifreeze. Okay, now, I got what I thought was full. The radiator's full. Uh, it wouldn't take any more. I feel pressure building in the hose. These are tight now. Uh, due to the engine's getting warm, it's almost up to temp. I topped off the reservoir tank as well. Now what I'm doing is I'm waiting for it to, and I'll wipe off the mess I spilled. Uh, now what I'm doing is I'm waiting for the temperature to get up to a, where the fan kicks on to see if the fan's going to kick on for me. Just here to kick on. And there it is blowing air, so that's working. There, it just kicked back off. Let's go look at what's going on inside. I think we're in business now. with the temp. I'll try to hold this steady. I'll rev it up a little bit. It was going way past 210. I actually had it over in the red at a couple times um, when this was happening. But now it's uh, seems to be running good. If this was an aluminum block, I could have been in trouble, but this is an all cast iron engine, so it's a little tougher. Well, it looks like it's hanging out under 210. It should creep up a little bit here. I'll see if I can hear the fan kick on. Be patient with me here. So you can see it creeping up. There you go, it's coming up a little bit there, which it should. Then the fan will kick on. 
There. I can hear the fan running. Let's watch what it does. Before the fan would run and it would just keep climbing because it wasn't spinning at the right RPM. And this is an analog, so it takes a second or two for it to pick up. Looks like it stopped going up. Starting, there it goes, it's going down. And it's a good test on an idle here while if it, with it doing that. The big test will be once I got the air running too. So it looks like it's working. Pulled it right back down. Should help maintain my temperature. Now outside temperature right now isn't that hot out at all. So it's working well. Let's take it for a test drive. Okay folks, I just took it around the block. Just a short drive around the neighborhood. Just to make sure everything's looking down here for any leaks, any drips. Any kind of transmission fluid leaks. Everything looks bone dry. So yeah, you want to do that before you go driving down the highway. Check your work that way. Now one thing that's interesting, the reason mine was overheating, another factor could have been this crack that I have here in the old radiator, would let the pressure out. One thing the pressure does, and what this cap does here, is maintains the pressure in your system. Water boils at I think 212 degrees. This engine runs about 210, so it's just on the edge of boiling. What keeps it from boiling is under pressure. When water's under pressure, the boiling temperature is higher. So that's why your, your uh, coolant systems run under pressure, is to keep that water from boiling. One thing I could hear when I shut this thing off is I'd hear the pressure bleed off immediately, and, all, and then you could hear the water churning in the engine where it's boil, actually went to a rolling boil type of sound. So that's why we do this. The fan's pushing lots of air. I think we got it fixed. Go look at the gauge one more time. Let's see what we got. Now I've been running the air when I rode, drove around town here. I just turned the air on to put extra stress on the system on purpose. We blowing cold, ice cold air out of the vents. And look at that, we're hanging out under 210. So let's take it down the highway now. Okay, we're running down the highway about 55, 60 miles. We've got about three miles now. Temperature still looks good. Problems, what I, what I ran into is when I went to stop, which I'm doing right now, sorry for the shake, and I would do a little driving around town. Oops, let me get back over here. Do a little driving around town and then things would get hot because I worked up all the engine heat and then I came to a stop and my fan wasn't running good enough and all that fun stuff. So yeah, you can see it's just holding right where it needs to. What's funny is where the camera's at here. Let's get the camera straight on so you can see where it's really running. It looked like it was running past 210, but it's really not. It's hanging there right where it needs to be. I'm gonna see if it creeps up a little bit here. It's not moving. The fan's doing what it's doing. I've got the air conditioner on. So usually when you have the air conditioner on, the fan always runs anyway. Looks like it's doing what it's supposed to do. It's not overheating now. I'm gonna call that a success. Okay folks, last and final step. I parked it in the front on some fresh concrete, clean concrete, pad out front of my shop or garage. I'm gonna look at it in the morning, make sure there's no red drips from the transmission anywhere, make sure there's no coolant stains anywhere on the ground. Plus, when it's cooled off, I can take that radiator cap off and double check that, the, the how full the radiator is, make sure I can still see green up there in the top. Uh, you don't want to do it when it's hot. If you do it when it's hot, it will blow up in your face. So do not remove that radiator cap once the temperature has come up. The water has expanded. Everything's under pressure. And as soon as you uncork that thing, it's going to shoot it right in your face. Don't do that. Uh, I've got another half a gallon. So this took about, oh, almost two gallons. Yeah, pretty much right at two gallons to top off the system. Uh, after I did all that so that that's not too bad so I had because I had a half gallon of 50 50 that was pre-mixed because uh, I don't like buying 50 50 but 
I needed it. I didn't have time to bring home a gallon and split it up and make two two gallons. Uh, it's way cheaper to do it that way, obviously. So what I did was split that bit, pour one half into another jug, topped it back off with water, and we're ready to go. So I hope you enjoyed this video. Did I bash on the engineering behind the Jeep a little bit? You bet I did. I'm not going to give anybody a break. If it's poorly engineered, I will tell you how it is. If it's well engineered, I will also compliment that as well. So I'll be fair and just. That's my way. So got any questions, throw it down in my, uh, you know, got any questions, you know, send me a message. Uh, if you like what you see, hit like. If you want to subscribe, please subscribe. More videos coming like this. Uh, I got to do spark plugs on that Jeep yet. It's wireless. Ooh, new stuff. It's wireless. It's two, It's 20 years old, but it's got a coil pack on top, so there's no spark plug wires like there is on my 80s yard Jeep that I've got. So I'm going to change the spark plugs in that. Uh, it's been starting kind of not real good, not as good as I think it should. Uh, my 04 starts way better, and so I think the spark plugs might be a little tired. I might have overworked them pulling the boat. Who knows? I think they've only been in there about 15,000 miles, but I'm not sure what brand they are. I'm putting NGKs in it. That's what I bought. I really like NGK V-Powers. Uh, I've used it in motorcycles, lawnmower equipment, all that stuff. It seems to just work better, uh, function better. It doesn't seem to foul out as easy. So thank you for watching, folks. We're going to end this video. I know this one got a little long-winded, but there was a lot going on, a lot of different things I had to touch on there to get that thing back together. Test one right test run went great it's uh not overheating it's it's holding steady that needle's right there as you saw uh just under 210 the real test is when it's 95 degrees out and i'm pulling my boat again we'll give it a workout it's not supposed to be that hot this weekend mid 80s but the good news is the boat goes to the lake this weekend and i'm back on fishing so that's what i love to do that's what i'm getting after that's the only reason i fix this stuff I, there's a sense of urgency I hate working on cars, I really do. I don't like working on them at all, but when it's to get my boat to the lake and back, I will dedicate my time to work on them. So I did this over the course of three or four nights, uh, a couple mornings, a few nights to do all this, no big hurry. Uh, but we're also gonna get after my Impala and finish up showing you what I'm doing on that for the transmission shift solenoids. I got the video, I'm about a third of the way done. I still got two thirds of that job to do yet. So thank you for watching folks, I'm cutting it off. Michael's Backyard Marina out. Enjoy life, always.